Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. And you're welcome along to Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. You can visit hri.ie or follow their Twitter account at hri racing. Hashtag every racing moment. Neil Tracy here with you this evening alongside Johnny Ward as usual. And I'm delighted to welcome tonight's guest, making marking a week of Galway legends retiring. We have Ian McCarthy. Ian, thanks for joining us and congratulations on, on finishing up a fantastic career. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, yeah, it was lovely. It was a, it was a nice way to go out now. And uh, uh, yesterday was a great day. So are you doing this to take the heat off Joe Canning or was Joe Canning doing this to take the heat off you? <laughs> I was saying one of the journalists there from that, the the Connacht Tribune actually said it to me yesterday. I says if, if you give me the front page, I says you can put Big Joe on the back page. But <laughs> no, look at it. I had yeah, funny enough. I actually uh, I played for a Gar Community School. Um, I think it was the juvenile club when I was in school there. And funny enough, I actually played uh, against Joe in 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 Portumna uh, one day in a schools match. But um, was he any use? No, look, look, it's 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 in the veneer, isn't it? Was he, what's the what's the feeling like actually Ian in Galway about it all? Does it come as a shock? Ah, look, it is. It is a big shock. I was actually at the Water game the other day, and I was at the under twenties game the other day as well. Like, and the under twenties were very good. Like, but even Johnny, when I'm in the wear room there, you can see the younger lads coming through, and there's there's a great bunch of them. Like, you know, and it's just I suppose it's it's time to move on. But like, it is a big shock for Joe to be gone, and he he's, he's been a superstar. Like, he's been. It's been some revelation for for Galway Hurling, isn't it? The, the the funny thing for me Ian, is that um, like after the game, you know, he didn't didn't have his best year for obvious reasons, and he's had injuries and all that. But it hasn't dawned on me at all that I'll never see him in a Galway jersey again. Yeah, definitely, it is. It is. It is a big shock. Sure, he's been a leader for so long. Like he's, I'm sure he brought. It was great to see him break the record the other day as well. Like and. Do you know, I just seen, I was reading the article on him when he did retire and he was obviously on TE and sort of said that he, he was, he was sort of, I think, apologising that he didn't do it and, and just say it like, do you know, but look, like, I suppose it's everyone for uh, when your time's up, you feel it yourself and you, and you just go and do it when you think the time is right. And was that, was that the case for yourself as well, Ian? It was, um, it's been probably going through my head a while. Look, I, I'm running a business at home and I've 20 or 25 to 30 horses in my care pre-training and, and breaking horses and, and a few pint of pointers. And look, I have a young family. I have I've two little girls and a wife. And look, I suppose, look, I had a great career and I enjoyed every single minute of it. And still to the ride yesterday, I loved it. And I got, I got some kick out of it. But like, I suppose being realistic, like I was a journeyman jockey. I had to work for what I got. I probably had no one behind me. And you see in the wear room, the amount of good riders that are there, like, and they're they're struggling probably to make a living out of it, like, but you just do it for the love of it, don't you? Yeah, and I think oftentimes some of those guys, Johnny, do have the have some of the more interesting stories behind them. I think, Ian, I saw you mentioning yesterday on uh, in an interview you did that you had, was it 80 or 90 winners maybe, and every single one of them had a story behind it. Definitely. Um, like the small owner and you're riding a winner in Roscommon and like you're riding a winner in Sligo and them small owners, the small syndicates to you know, riding winners at the Galway festivals and definitely like I I go through them in my head there and they all bring back memories from me. First winner like for, for Desi Hughes being Tiffy and eight of all the way along like to no I think Mick Winters, I actually think it was him I rode my last winner for like but like great characters, great owners and as I said yesterday, a story behind every one of them that that uh, that there's plenty of great memories. Yeah, I, I, I actually I kind of agree with what you're alluding to there, Neil. I, I've always found the journey of the journeyman far more interesting than the, than the journey of a champion. And if I, I was, if I was, I was, I've said to myself for a long time, if I ever write a racing book, I want to write it on somebody whose career was a struggle, effectively. That it was like, um, you know, it was, it was, it, you weren't going to get the headlines, but you enjoyed it. And 
there was a book on um, Suffolk Downs, which is a racetrack which is now actually defunct in Boston. Um, I forget the name of it now, and I, it was one of my favourite books, funny enough, but it was it cat catalogued the characters that made up a struggling racetrack at a time when American racing was kind of on the on the um, on the way down. And it, it, th that that scrap for survival to me is more interesting than winning Grade Ones. But you you obviously developed a love for the game at an early stage. I, I presume you hurled a bit as well, Ian, did you? I did. I suppose like growing up, Johnny, like. It was it was all hurling. I'm from a rural parish, Kilbacanty, just outside of Gart, like, and it's nothing but hurling. Obviously, you're I think you're you're not Galway all football, but it was all it was all hurling, and all I wanted to do as a young fella was hurl for Galway, and that was that's all that was in my head. And look, I got the bug in, and through ponies and that, and through South Galway Pony Club and pony racing, and I ended up going to race and so on, and. I served me time with Desi Hughes for, for 10 years and I tell you, that was one hell of an education, I'll tell you. I spoke to Roger Lochran during the week for a piece I was doing about Galway Plate winners and um, Roger was talking about how when he won the Galway Plate, it was on Far From Trouble for uh, Christy Roach and Tony McCoy was doing, you're talking about every 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 horse, every winner has a story, Tony McCoy was doing 10 stone 4 that day, um, which to me now would be pretty much as low as he could go, but in a, in a race preceding it, he'd a bad fall and Roger had basically had a relationship with Christy Roach and he was going into the weighing room, he was pulled up on a horse that was fancied Roger, he was going into the weighing room and he he gestured him over to say, would you ride uh, far from trouble, would you do 10-4? And he said, I would. And he said, I won the race and so on anyway, I beat Ansar, we'll all remember Ansar, Dermot Wells, but yeah. he said, it was the previous winter, um, Ian, that the Central House incident had happened. And if, if a lot of you will remember Central House, Roger mistook the winning post yeah. in Central House. Um, one of the most embarrassing things, obviously, to happen to Jockey. Desi Hughes was an absolute gentleman, the way he dealt with that that day. He, was, he, he carried Roger more or less into the, into the parade ring afterwards and said, don't worry about it. But he, he, he said, he finished the story and he said, anyway, after a far from trouble won, couldn't believe it. And the first person over to me to congratulate me was Desi Hughes. Yeah, I remember well, Johnny. I think I uh, at that time I'd only a couple of rides got, and I actually I was riding that day. And look, it was um, the way Desi dealt with it, and I suppose the public and and everyone. But like I'll never forget that day and the, the way Desi put his arm around him. But funny enough, the way it worked out, I remember Ted Walsh coming into the weigh room that day and putting his hand on um, on Roger's shoulder and telling him to put it behind him, and that was it. And uh, look, I, I learned a hell of a lot of, uh, of Desi Hughes. I'm sure Roger was there and there was a number of lads um, that were there. I think there was there was maybe 13 lads with licenses that time when I was there, like, and it was very competitive, like, but like, as I was saying, like the way he dealt with it and, and I remember Ted specifically that day and funny enough, Lord of mercy on Desi, when, when he passed away, I was sort of left in an unknown as to where I go and I funny enough, I was riding. Uh, Ted asked me to ride work one day, and I started to use that as a base for a year when I was freelancing and finding it tough. Like, but there were two men that that taught me a hell of a lot, and it's that generation that that educated me, like uh, on what I'm doing now in breaking and pre-training horses, and and the different side of it. Yeah, and the. Like the two of them, I suppose, two good mentors as well. And I, I was, I was actually talking to Mark Enright as well about the same piece because he'd, he, he'd um, ridden obviously Clarkham, and he was saying that he he doesn't get much of a buzz out of riding on the flats since he switched to it. But he said when you're riding work on the flats, um, it's actually more lucrative than riding work um, over jumps. So you basically want you needed to make money. You mean you needed to have a career and you needed to put bread on the table, I suppose. That's it, definitely. Like it, like look, it's it's a buzz you get. It's a sport, and you get a great kick out of it. But at the end of the day, as you said, like you have to put your bread and butter on the table, and you know you have to make a payable. There's a lot of mileage. I'm very good friends with Mark. Like, and he, as you said, he rode a winner of a Galway plate. Like, and you'd say, "Geez, this lad's gonna fly," Do you know, and like a hell of a rider, and like. He's working hard and he's reverted back and he's he's riding on the flat now and he's watching his weight and he he's doing well for himself and he will do you know he works hard and and please God he, he's many many more winners to ride. You spoke uh, earlier on in the chat with us here, Ian, about how a lot of the as you say journeyman jockeys at times would struggle to make ends meet and put food on the table. Uh, was it a struggle for yourself at times during the career? 
Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, like there's times there, and 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 you're writing work for lads, and you're you are you are trying to make a wage. But look, it it all pays off. It's a it's a great industry, and there's there's plenty of people there you can turn to, and they'll give you advice. And uh, look, it worked out well for me. I made a good living out of it. I wouldn't change anything for the world. I enjoyed every minute of it. I've my family there. I've my own yard and house built. And look, it it owes me nothing. We were. I was on a WhatsApp group talking about you earlier, and they were saying that uh, you'll have to bring up any second now with him. Um, because I think uh, it, it was it was kind of a memorable maiden hurdle to see this horse at such a big price do what he could do. And I think uh, you must have gotten off that day and said, I think it was in Nav, and you must have said this lad is good. Yeah, I actually, funny enough, I rode him work. Um, I think the week before, Ted asked me would I meet him at half twelve in the car one day. I said I would, and I I rode him, and he said to me. Uh, he says, have a sit in him, let him let him quicken for the last four furlongs and we, we let him quicken and I actually pulled up, Ted was riding a horse himself, watching the gallop and he was standing on the curra and I pulled up and I went over to him and I says, I says, it's a hell of a horse and he says, uh, yeah, he says, I'll talk to Frank and, and JP and see if we can get you to spin them and I'll tell you, it, it stands out for me because JP McManus, when you get them green and 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 yellow colours on your on your back, like it's it, it means a hell of a lot. Um, he does a hell of a lot for Irish racing, and and in England also. But the amount of people he supports, and uh, lucky enough now in um in my yard at home, um, he he's, he's also support me with a couple of horses. In twenty years' time, Ian, when you sit back and look at the career, what are the what are the moments that'll that'll still be there front and center in your mind? Look, I, I probably started out my actually third winner was a grade three on a, a horse of my uncle's, um of of, of Flory. Um and that that she she got me first graded winner and my third third winner, grade three, it was unbelievable and uh won a couple on her. I suppose a highlight definitely stands out to be Jenny's jewel. Um, like with some great days, great winners. She was she was a hell of a mare, um, and she took me into that Grade One company. And I was I was always saying to the lads, like I was I was claiming, and she came on the scene, and I won me maiden hurdle in her listed race, and then she stepped into Grade a company. I won a, a Grade Three in her in Clonmel, and I think I was suspended one day, and uh, Barry Barry Garrity rode her. Um, Barry Garrity rode her and uh, I said, oh, geez, it's, it's, that's, that's me done now with Jenny's Jewel and the loyalty, Jarlett Fahey and 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 the McIntyres and, and the owners, what what the loyalty they showed, they put me back on her and I look, I rode her in Cheltenham and Ascot and she's, she's the standout. Johnny, I imagine you've spoken to dozens, maybe even hundreds of jockeys down the years about retirement and things like that. I, I'm sure for most of them, the fact that they're able to make the decision themselves is probably a hugely important one, just given the industry itself. Oh, like, 100%. Um, you know, you watch the documentaries on the jockeys who sustained injuries, you know, paralysis, and sometimes um, it, it ends up even worse. And, um, I, you know, they, they always are very brave about it and they have to get on with it. But um, obviously life will never be the same again. And if you can go out in your own terms... Um, you know, Rachel Blackmore, she obviously missed Galway. She had a bad fall uh, just in the lead up to the festival. And um, Rachel has so many falls, it's normalised us. You know, um, if you're chucked out of a car onto hard grass, unbeknownst to yourself at 35, 40 miles an hour, you'd probably know about it. But when that happens every sort of week or two, it's just another fall or whatever, but it, it isn't like, and you know, Rachel, I remember the documentary Jumps, Jumps Girls when they showed her fall in the Grand National a few years ago. I defy anyone to look at that and not wince. And that's what they do every day. And Ian goes out in his own terms. And um, also he has his career that he's kind of going straight into. You know, retirement is difficult um, for for the likes of Joe. You know, it, he's going he's to hurt for Portumna or whatever, but he'll never get that back. And it's not, he's, he mightn't want to go into coaching, you know, whereas in racing, the likes of Ian, he's already kind of easing his way into the pre-training side of things, and um, I, I think that's great. That you know, may, maybe we spoke to Stephen O'Donnell during the week. He said Pat's were playing Rovers tonight, and he said I for him, I, I get more of a kick out of managing than 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 playing. And maybe a lot of jockeys will actually enjoy that next um, path even more, where they educate horses and bring them on. 
Ian, I was just saying it to Johnny there how important it probably is for so many jockeys and I imagine for yourself that the decision to retire was something you were able to make yourself and it wasn't forced upon you. Yeah, definitely. Look, as I said, Neil, it was sort of going through my head for a while and I'll have to thank um, Michael Maloney and all the staff at Galway. I emailed him actually two weeks ago and I asked him would there be any chance I could get a couple of tickets for my family and look, they, they didn't hesitate at all. I had my family there yesterday. I actually, my wife, Nikki, I didn't even tell her to be honest and, and my mother and father, I told no one and and look, it was, it was a lovely touch. And I'll tell you, it was, it was emotional enough. The lads gave me the guard of honour on the way out. And uh, it, it was a great touch. And it, look, it was grand. And the family were there. And that's all I wanted. I didn't want and and no fuss or anything about it. And uh, no, look, it, it was lovely the way it was done. And we went for a bit of dinner yesterday evening afterwards. And it was it was perfect. I heard, Actually, there, there was a story going around that Joe Canning couldn't get tickets for yesterday. So you were to blame, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Asher, look, it, it, it's difficult times, isn't it? Like, you know, a thousand people, it is very disappointing when you when you see the crowds that are going to Crow Park and so forth. Like, but look, hopefully we're, we're on the right road and uh, we, we'll, we'll be back to normality soon and, and get the crowds back. But it was nice to get a little bit of an atmosphere there yesterday, Anna. So it was Hanoi Jane you were riding yesterday for, for Ted Walsh in the, in the Guinness Novice Hurdle. Um, what do you remember about that ride? Were you trying to take in as much as you could? Just the the surroundings, just trying to to bottle the feeling of of your final ride, or were you kind of just in the zone of this is work? Um, look, I I uh, chat with Ted and, and it was it was the final ride. He just told me to go out and enjoy it. He says and uh, he says get her settled early on. And funny enough, I actually broke the filly um, for the owner Peter O'Reilly. Um, so I, I knew her quite well. I had a lot of school and done with her and a lot of homework done with her. But look, she's a nice filly. Was probably a little bit out of her depth. And uh, but uh, yeah, please God, she 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 go on and she'll win races for for Ted and, and the owners as well. But look, it it was my last ride. But still, look, it, it was no different to Anthony else. Really, you just went out and you were you had to get your job done, and that was it. There, there is, there is like the, he broke that filly, like so he was a uh, part for your part for early education. We had um, Susie Barkley on there the other day on about you know the rehoming of horses, and I think he does 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 possibly scope for like I don't know if there's a social media thing, but the story of the horse is an awful lot more than the race. I mean the race takes place for a few minutes, a sprint might take place for a minute, but the life of the horse is actually and the people involved and. Often the you know talking to Norman Lee about Soul Pretender, the work he had to do to get him back fit this year after a ligament injury. There's so much going on behind the scenes and so many people that are party to it, including the owners, obviously. Oh, definitely it starts from an early age. I think she's five. That filly I rode yesterday. Uh, Peter dropped me o- dropped her over to me when she was t- a two year old, and he says, uh, Ian, can you do a couple of weeks with her?" And he says, "See how you go." And uh, look, I. I was long running her and driving her and uh, taught her all the all the all the tricks of the trade early and got her riding and she went home for a break and she came back as a three year old and she she done another six to eight weeks and like that's all through two year old three year old four year old like there's a, there's a hell of a lot of work on it gone into that filly and uh, no she she she'll be okay she 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 she'll do a little job for him she would have recognised you yesterday as well yeah I don't know about that I know but. <laughs> She's a little bit of a lady, I know. She's a, she's a handful, but look, she 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 she's fine. What's what's next on the cards for you? And then Johnny was talking, obviously, about the, you know, the business you have and and the work you do. Like you're still heavily involved in the industry. And obviously, you have to hurl for Galway, I presume. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the charity match, Johnny. I'd say that yeah. about the hype of it now. Um, Look, I as I said, I, I have a business set up there. I, I have 25, 30 horses in my care at home. There's there's five or six lads that come in and ride out for me. I'm, I'm very lucky with the lads I have right now for me, a, a great bunch of lads. And it, it, it's working very well at the minute. I ran four pint of pinters last season, and three of them won. Uh, Ballybook Mate have won, actually won a bumper in Tipperary for me. Uh, I could run them under a handler's license. They brought in them races. Um, so he was my first and probably one of my only runners that I'll have on the track but he went and he won and we sold him but it's that line I'm going down as in trading in a couple of horses and look tra- training's not on the cards for me definitely not at the moment um, I love dealing with young horses and educating them and uh, that that that's where I'm going Neil 
what um what aren't you going to miss about the the day to day life of a jockey? Look, I I don't think there's anything. I I, I loved it. I suppose what I will miss is the lads in the wear room. Like, what a bunch of fellas! Like, you know, the dog friends I've made. As I said to someone yesterday, like. I packed my bag in 2004 and 2005. I knew no one in Kildare, absolutely nobody. I've no racing background, I've nothing. But the amount of people like in racing and the amazing people from in every area, you've doctors, physios, you've vets, everything like there's, there's, it's a great industry to be involved in. And I'm so happy that I'm going to be still involved in it heavily. Um, but what, you're saying, what will I not miss? Look, it's what I will miss. I, I'll, I'll miss it all, obviously, but it's, it's time to move on now. But I'd say the lads in the wear room and, and that buzz is, is probably going to be the killer. What was what was that like when you were heading out from Galway to Kildare as, as you said, like a 14, 15-year-old kid, not knowing a soul out there, taking on this this massive journey? Were you a were you a confident young lad or w- would you have naturally been shy? Was it, was it a, like a big, big step for you? Look, you you try to be confident. I suppose in racing, it is a massive thing. You have to have confidence in racing and and no matter what you're doing. And and riding, I think the main thing in race riding is is confidence or or any sport. But look, I'd say I was confident enough. And look, it blended in. There was 30 of us in the class that time and we were all in the same boat. And we gelled together and we we, we got on well and we all worked hard and we met above it. Who was there actually? Sean Flanagan, Shane Foley, Paddy Kennedy, um, there was a there was a good bunch of us there. Um, Matthew O'Connor, um, yeah, there was there was there was a great bunch of lads there at the time, but they're probably the lads that are still riding at the moment, Johnny. It's mad. Like you, did you, you see them developed in as people as well from the? I suppose like, do you know at that stage who's going to make it, or is it is it a lot about grafting and confidence, as you say? Ah, you don't like it. Geez, that's an early stage, and a couple of lads went down different routes, and a couple of lads went down the farrier route, and you know, a, a jockey wasn't for them. Like, but and look, a lot of graft goes into, it and lads leave the car and they change yards and they go to the UK, and you know, um, I Sean Flanagan went to went to Dusty Sheehy that time. He took off. He was one of the first of us to get going, and Matthew O'Connor Strawberry uh, look took off and unfortunately he had a bad fall and he was forced to retire at a very young age like so when I look back at that like I'm, I'm glad to walk out now and uh, I'm in one piece What advice would you give jockeys starting off at that age now? Oh you just have to keep your head down and work hard work as hard as you can and you know like uh, you have to ride work for as many trainers as you can but I, I think if you, if you work hard it, it'll reap its rewards how how long were you into that apprenticeship before you you knew you you really had caught the bug and this was this was something you were going to be sticking with? I'd say from the get go, to be honest, um, just loved it. And then you're following the lads and watching the lads racing. They're a bit older than you and more forward than you in the yard. And you're saying, "Geez, I I I I want to do that." And you're going racing. You're leading up horses like, but like I I think from my first ride, I say to the track, it took me two years to ride my first winner. But when I got my first winner and I get the ball got rolling, then look at it, 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 it was great. It was the winners were coming and it, it was it was brilliant. I'm always was, cu- I'm always sorry. curious as well. Sorry to interrupt you. I'm always curious about hearing about the the first winner. So it was, I have it here in front of me. It was Tefia Native in uh, 2007 yeah. for Desi Hughes. Like you've obviously been you've been involved in the game for a couple of years before that. But what's the what's the difference in the adrenaline rush like when you cross that line first for the very first time? Ah, sure, it's unbelievable. Like you know, yeah, and then you see the younger lads there now. They're riding their first winners. Like you, you get a you get a great kick out of it. But like you get off that and you go back in, you hand your saddle to the valets on the table. Like you and you and you walk back out to change. Then what you want is the next one. Yeah. Do you know that's behind you and you look forward and you say, well, cool, I need to get the next one. And do you know that's that's the way you have to be in sport, don't you? Like yeah. You, you have to you have to be hungry and, and want more, you know. Do you know do you know what I would have noticed a bit as well that um some of the jockeys coming through now, more so maybe on the flat. Um I'm thinking of young Rob Huerty with Gavin Cromwell. Uh, Daniel King, I think, is with um he's doing a bit maybe with Dennis Hogan, James McCauley. Yeah. I ju- you're watching these lads. I I think I've watched the, the, their I think their first ride or one of their first rides, just and they're just two off the top of my head. 
And you'd be amazed, like, that not only have they not been the winner, they're literally 10 pound claimers just starting off. Yeah. Yeah, but it, like, all they need is one to click, like, you know, and and, and they will get rolling, like, but I, like, once you're able to ride and, and, and you work hard and keep your head down, and, you know, you, you, you will get on, you will get on in this game, like. And it's just, uh, it's a tough game, I guess. It's the only thing is that the, you know, speaking to some of the, uh, I, I spoke to Shane Shortwell during the week who doesn't ride anymore, obviously another former golf yeah. winner, and it's, it is a bit of a scrap once you're not in that top, like I suppose, you know, it's a bit like capitalism, I suppose, a very small percent of people have most of the winners. Yeah, definitely. Like, sure, look, you, you name five riders, six riders off the top of your head that are absolutely flying and hell of riders, and after that then, you're trying to pick up the pieces and maybe get into yards and ride out as much as you can. Like, but look, I even like as I said to you, like, look, I I had I look I had a grand career and I rode winners and but like the buzz I got off them couple of winners, like I I couldn't imagine the likes of Rachel or Paul or 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 Davy or, or Ruby or any of them like the buzz they got. But I got my own kick out of what I got and look, I wouldn't have changed one single thing. Look, I hope I I've absolutely no regrets. I worked as hard as I could, and I gave it I gave it me best. And the most important thing I I can take out of it is I made an awful lot of friends out of this game, and I, I'm I'm delighted to go out like this. And if the daughters are going down the sporting route, camogie or jockey ship, what would you advise? I'd say camogie, Johnny. Yeah. I think so, yeah. And there's no money in Camogie yeah. either. And st they'll stay in school till they do their leaving cert. Well, that, that's that's a good point, though, in fairness, to end up because the, like jockeys don't tend to get full education, and like it does stand to you. Yeah, look, we we were lucky enough, Johnny. Like, I done my junior cert and I left school. Like, but in, I went to race, like, and we more or less got equivalent to a past leaving cert. Mm. But I. I'll tell you the truth, if I got 500 points in my leaving cert, which there'd absolutely be no chance of, <laughs> you'd, I'd be still in the same position I'm in, because there's absolute. I, I wouldn't have went down another path, like, I wanted to be, I wanted to be a jockey, if, if I, if I got all the points in the world and went to college, I would not have hoped, but i do it, I wanted to be a jockey, and look, I, I gave my best shot, and I got me few winners over, and, and that's it. Well, Ian, it's been a pleasure having you on Friday Night Racing and congratulations on a fantastic career and the very best of luck with everything in the future. Best of luck, Ian. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Johnny. Ian McCarthy there here on Friday Night Racing, which is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Johnny, even as you're talking there to Ian... And as you mentioned it earlier on in the in the chat with him, were you just kind of are you do you have a little book at home with the the various sports sports people you want to do the autobiographies for? I did the, the journeyman people like you mentioned. Yeah, because um, do you know like it's 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 grand. Like here am I. I won the. I'm, this is how I won this grade one, and this is how I won that grade one, and then I got that injury, but I came back and I rode a hundred grade one winners. It's like, well, what about the fact that you know you might have problems with your weight? You know, you might have to ride a lot of horses that essentially are not fancied. What's, what's it like in terms of going months and months and months without not only a winner, but the prospect of a winner, having to be motivated and knowing that that natural regression is probably going to set in because everyone that comes on says, everyone that comes on will say, you get better by riding good horses. And if you're not riding good horses and um, you're constantly, you know, dealing with um, sort of, Le less talented horses that you expect to finish down the field what's that like and his love for the game despite the fact that he was a journeyman there's no no getting away from that talented journeyman his love from the game never seemed to ebb and I think that's amazing I think that's that's a sign of a good character that uh, just positive ment positive mentality loved the game and goes out on a high um, because um, I remember talking to Ken Whelan I, 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 I joked to Ken that I was going to write his book and he was well up for it maybe I'll get down to it someday Ken has kind of dabbled in this and that after racing but Ken was the quintessential journeyman jockey but the only thing is I don't think most of his stories would be printable so I, I, I kind of was wondering what am I going to actually print in this book because a lot of it I like, won't be able There's to There's a list in. of results But yeah when, when the likes of them gets like when, when Ken gets a winner at, at you know Cheltenham or something like that that's just I don't know, like he speaks about Teffy and Adam and like I could even have been racing that day. There, there, there's often a more interesting story, like the 
I know a fella who who the winner there last week, and he's paid for a hair transplant out of it. You know, there's always a mad story out of racing. You know, and maybe there's maybe there's a that's the book you're gonna write. <laughs> there's a lesson in racing. Like, yeah, if you wanna if you wanna get your hair sorted out, just land a big uh, touch or whatever. But yeah, it's a great game, and uh, the, you know, often the the small winners are a lot more compelling, I think, as an narrative than the the the, the Galway hurdle win or whatever. Your biggest challenge, if you are going to be doing that though, Johnny, is the the way you sell it to them because it's going to be a tough one to bring them up and go, listen. I want to write a want to write a racing book, but I don't want to write about any of the stars. I want to write about the about I, I want to write about someone who didn't really have a great career. Well, like did it, Eamon Dunphy's book, which I, it's sad to say I actually haven't read, which I should have. But like he was a journeyman footballer, and that was his um, that was basically his his selling point. Like I'm not I'm not like we all know the Joey Barton line about you know I played for England, played crap. Here's my book. But Eamon Dunphy's book was was brilliant because it was a journeyman and Paul Kimmage's like rough ride when I read that like Kimmage was you know I guess he was a good cyclist but he was never going to necessarily win a Tour de France or whatever but that struggle like that's that struggle to 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 it's just a struggle to survive it's not a struggle necessarily to win I I find that a lot more interesting than the lad who basically gets all the the best looking women and wins all the races <laughs> you know I don't know that's just maybe that's just me uh before we finish up then as well obviously it's Galway week how was, how was Galway week this week? We were talking off air beforehand. You were singing the praises of Patrick Mullins, who was on on Friday night racing with yourself and Ger last week. Had a had a big win yesterday with Saldi in the Galway hurdle. Well, he he is kind of an anomaly because he kind of does get all the does get all the girls, wins all the races, um, but is also like he's a very very good writer. So like I was talking, right, writer or writer? He's a, he's a very good writer, obviously, but he's a very good writer. Oh, so, okay. So when he did his copy for, when I worked for the Irish Independent, Patrick would send in his copy. Like, he would actually send the copy in. So it's not one of these ghost written and... You're not having a phone call with him and then you're transcribing No, it. and you're, you're reading his piece and you're like, gee, like, I, I so work from time to time in various guises and this is as clean as you get. And he has that option if he wants to go down the route, when, I presume he's going to become a trainer. But So he, he, he rode Saturday in the Galway hurdle. Bear in mind now, he came on and he's never won the GPT, which is the traditional amateur's race, partly because he can't really do the weight. And he explained all this to Gerald last week. But now he's ridden three of the last four Galway hurdle winners as an amateur. That, that's completely off the charts. And the, the, the crazy thing about Saturday was, Saturday was... At Royal Ascot in his last race, having won easily on the flats time four, he was sent off 15 to 8 favourite at Royal Ascot, and there wasn't a bean for him. Like there was no money for him. Patrick was seemed to seem to suggest in his column and last Friday, oh, I think he might be a bit too slow for this trip. Will he put on cheek pieces on him? He travelled like a dream um, in a really, really messy race. And I, I have to say, Patrick was riding an 18 to 1 chance, so it wasn't like he was riding a hot favourite. And it's an unbelievable mm -hmm. achievement to one of the genuinely, genuinely nice guys uh, of racing to win three Galway hurdles as an amateur. Yeah, and just in general on the Galway Festival this week, even though the crowd was only, was it 1,000? Um, watching it on TV, they actually did, I think they did quite a good job of focusing on the the little pocket of a crowd as much mm. as possible because anytime I saw people around there it actually did look like a lot more and it, it just made Galway look a little bit more like the Galway Festival. Definitely and I suppose it should be like I, I completely disagreed with the 1000 I think a lot of people in racing did because it created issues with a lot of people are going to be in Galway City now as opposed to the race course but there was reasoning behind it and the reasoning was from a good place um, in terms of the pandemic and Galway um, despite you know their 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 struggles to get more. They got on with it. Um, I'd say Michael Maloney had a disastrous week trying to, you know, focus on ticket requests like Ian there when, you know, it, it, there were so few people in. But it was a thousand people as well as owners and personalities at the track. So it's more than a thousand people. And the thousand people, I'm sure, they really appreciated being there. Galway's a special, special meeting. There's nothing like it. Um, a lot of locals, for Ian to bow out at his local track, he'll never forget a day like that. And, you know, to see people talking about their winners. Um, I saw Johnny Corbett, the Galway United uh, board member. He was in the winner's enclosure. You know, he's a local man. That's what it's all about. And at least somebody was there because last year it was soulless. There was nobody there. And this was, it wasn't the old Galway, but it was definitely somewhere in between. Yeah, it was getting back to something we recognise a bit more. Um, I know we did want to mention as well the bizarre incident uh, a couple of days back involving Jessica Harrington. So she had to apologise after she won to use inverted commas, the uh, two-year-old Phillies maiden on Tuesday evening with a three-year-old handicapper. But it emerged afterwards. It was Aurora Princess uh, was due to run later on that card, finished first past the post. 
but it should have been a different horse. Can you explain to us what happened here? Yeah, it was the wrong horse, basically. It was sent to the race. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a chipping system to identify the horse. And, um, you know, the horses would have been brought into... the. I think you, you have to... You get your um, identification checked as you come into the race course, I think. Um, but then thereafter... I, I'm not 100% sure of the procedure for this, but what I, what I can say is I never remember this happening in Ireland before. It has happened in England, but I never remember a case of the wrong horse um, being, being found out after the race. Um, so it's, it's like it's a complete outlier. And I've symp- I've massive sympathy for Jessica Harrington because she is one of the most honourable people without a shadow of a doubt and one of the most talented in racing and by all accounts she was fairly um, bet up over this really that this could happen because it was obviously quite embarrassing but we all make mistakes uh, Fran Berry was saying how he texted <laughs> he was on paddock duty and like there was uh, it, it, Dermot Weld had a hot pot in the race I shouldn't laugh but I mean it's, nobody died and we all get on with it Dermot, Dermot Weld had a hot pot in the race I tipped Aidan O'Brien's horse Twinkle just because I thought it was a better price but Fran was looking at the horses beforehand and he's like Jessica Harrington, she's a fine, fine horse. Like, she does not look like a three-year-old debutante um, or a two-year-old debutante. So he's texting his mate, can you, can you back her for me? And the price had gone in anyway. So a lot of people had latched on to, this horse looks, looks good. And then in the race, um, you know, the, the, the analysis, like, that horse looks very professional for a horse first time out. Turns out it was a different horse. So, so obviously, the, the problem then is if you back the horse, you'd no chance of winning. Twinkle won the race. I'd mates, I told, to back Twinkle in Galway. They, they only realised several hours later that the horse had won, that their dockets long thrown away. I couldn't remember where they put them. Um, so it was It was kind of a... Obviously, there was an element of tragic comedy to it, but, you know, it, I've, I've sympathy for people involved. Mistakes happen, and it, it was just one of them things. Yeah, look, in fairness to Jessica Harrington, she was hugely apologetic afterwards, just to read out some quotes here. She says, it's never happened to me before, but I suppose it is always an accident waiting to happen. It's not the first time it's happened to people. It happened to Aidan O'Brien at Newmarket last year as well, but it's just human error. I'm very, very upset about it, and I'm very, very sorry. And Niall Cronin of the IHRB Communications said, Mrs Harrington has taken full responsibility for what's happened. She referred to the two horses during the inquiry as being almost identical, like twins. So it seems that's where the, the well, confusion arose. If you if you uh, go down to Aidan O'Brien's of a morning and... It's particularly impressive with him because he has so many horses by Galileo who have very similar traits and he can just like reel them off one by one. That's that horse, that's that horse. Could be 200 horses, that's that, that's that, that's that. And a lot of them will look very, very alike um, and it amazes me. Um, but I suppose before we before we finish up, I should mention one of the good news stories of the week that last week we, we spoke of this like fledgling GoFundMe um, thing for John Hassett who's fighting cancer. I, I think the page was set up on Friday. I forgot about it until the Monday. I checked in on the Monday. The 250 grand had been raised in the space of like three or four days for John's cancer treatment in Germany and racing um, should be very, very proud of itself. I was briefly on the page looking at some of the donations from people like Noel Mead and Michael Halford and trainers and owners and so on and so forth. Quarter of a million raised for John Hassett in the space of literally a weekend, I think is staggering. Yeah, nice way to to finish things off, Johnny. Thanks a million. A reminder as well, the toast tend to follow standings. We'll keep you updated every single week. Tom Malone has only added a handful of of points to his toast tend to follow lead so far this week, but he remains comfortably, comfortably in the top spot on 281 points. Johnny, you're still struggling. Well, in in many ways, yeah. But this, well, they're fighting a losing battle here, to be honest. Bugsy has uh, gone into an unassailable lead and uh, he knows he's flat racing. He certainly does, even after, after, he's, after he's left our stable, his career is still flourishing. Well, it's, I guess it's afforded the, the likes of you the chance to present this show, and I think you're, it's really grown on you week to week. It really has, yeah. it really has, yeah. Two out of three now. Speaking, I heard you on the boxing earlier, it's been a, been a good, busy day for you. Very, very busy couple of weeks, very busy, very busy couple of weeks. And more to come as well, Johnny. Indeed. Well, listen, thanks a million for joining us on Friday Night Racing this week. Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment and visit hri.ie. Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.